So in my mind, I have this image of parents jumping off of this Ferris wheel. They're like, I have to jump off before it goes one more loop around. And what I'm trying to build is a wonderful landing pad for the families who are jumping off this Ferris wheel. And I want to build a phenomenal micro school in every community so that for the parents who are jumping off the Ferris wheel, there is a great place for them to go to. Hello and welcome back to the Hannah Franklin podcast. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Amar Kumar. Amar is the founder of KaiPod Learning, a network of micro schools launched in Boston, currently in five different states and with affiliate schools in 25 different states. KaiPod also runs KaiPod Catalyst, a program that helps educators launch their own micro schools around the country. In today's episode, Amar and I talk about his experience growing up in a family that emigrated from India to the States in order to have access to American education, and Amar's experience going from private schools in India to public schools in America, and some of his surprise that the education in America was not necessarily as dramatically different as his family had expected when they made the move halfway across the world. We talk about his experience going to engineering school before realizing that actually his calling was in education and some of the things that he learned in his decades of experience working both in schools in India and America and working for different education companies before finally starting KaiPod during the pandemic. We talk about some of the biggest learnings that Amar has had in launching KaiPod, some of the biggest things that parents are looking for when they're searching for micro schools and other alternatives to the public system. And we talk about KaiPod's model of unbundling some of the different offerings of school, the academic component, the social component, the childcare component and how KaiPod is focused on dialing in the socialization and childcare aspects of school while still giving parents the freedom to choose the academic model that's the best fit for their child. Amar and I went super deep into some of the bigger philosophical questions around education in the era of the internet, and I hope you enjoy listening. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited that we're finally doing this. There's so much that I want to talk to you about with what you're building with KaiPod um, and also your own education story, which is where I want to start because you are you lived like the extreme version of choosing a lifestyle around education because your family moved from India to the United States when you were a kid because of education. They wanted to get an American quality education and they moved halfway around the world to get it. That's such an interesting story and I want to start there. Tell me about what that was like. It's a good place to start because in so many ways that is the instigator for why I'm in this field today. You know, when I, I was born in India, it, it probably a middle class or upper middle class family where in India, 70% of kids go to a private school, and I was one of those kids. <clears throat> and I went to a very nice private school in, in the effect of it was academically rigorous, had lots of nice activities, a good social environment. Yet at that time in India, even those nice schools had very limited opportunities for what you do after. India was still very much a closed economy, and uh, there just weren't many career paths for post-graduation. And I was 10, so obviously I was not thinking about any of this, but my parents were thinking about the future. And they had other family who had emigrated to the United States, and they had a pathway, they had a visa that they had applied for, you know, I think when I was born. And so 10 years later, they were given the visa to, to, to migrate. And so they took it up. And I remember, when, I still remember the day they told me we're moving to America. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? Like, what do you mean we're moving to America? Cause I'd really never moved in my life. Um, and when they started to explain what it was all about or why, you know, as a kid didn't really make any sense, but what I remember feeling 
is there's something that's not good enough about this and there's something better about that. I remember that feeling. And I also remember the day we were leaving, March 27th, actually March 27th, yeah, almost exactly, uh, what, like 20, 32 years ago. I remember had this really heavy feeling of guilt that I get to leave, but all these other people don't. So those things are sort of very much seared in my brain that people often do have the luxury to choose their education system. And those who do, do it. And those who don't have that luxury, they get stuck behind. And in so many ways, that's such a driving force behind what I do today is for those who don't have the luxury to choose, how do we give that to them? How do we give them options? How much of this was your family's culture versus the broader societal culture that you were growing up in? Like, was every family with the means trying to leave India and get to America because the education system was better? Was your family, did your family particularly value education? Did you have a yeah. sense of this when you were moving or was it all just completely foreign to you? It was foreign to me, but I think in hindsight or looking back and talking to our family about it over the last several years, decades, <clears throat> it's not just means, but it's also an awareness of the importance of education. A lot of families in India have means and they have been able to secure those means because of their Indian businesses or employment or whatever, but they don't necessarily appreciate the importance of a different education system. So yeah, there were a fair number of people who were trying to leave, uh, but not everyone. And so I, in some ways, I'm lucky that my parents had that foresight. They had the resources and the foresight and the connections to be able to make that job. So then where did that come from if if not everyone in their community was all valuing education the same why did they have this strong sense that cuz that's that's a huge commitment you're you're valuing education over everything else in your life over your community your extended family your culture your culture's values your own careers as parents like you're leaving all of that behind and moving half a world away yeah. to deliver a better education for your kids. Where did that sensibility that that was so important come from? Yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I do know that my my uncle, my dad's older brother, had migrated uh, several years before. He'd obviously had a strong outcome as a result. His kids were happy. So I think seeing that certainly mm -hmm. pushed my parents. Um, but when I reflect on that, you know, my parents were, or I am today, the age that my parents were when they moved. And if I think about moving my young family to, let's just say, Germany or wherever else, Australia, to come up with a completely new life, new community, new routines, new home for this theoretical concept of a better education, it's a scary prospect. And so, um, yeah, I, I applaud my parents. I'm in awe of the decision they made. They had great communities where they lived. They had a strong career where they lived, but they gave all of that up for this. And that just shows you how much parents do for their kids, how much they're willing to sacrifice for their kids. And we're seeing that today in America. It's it's really powerful when when you frame it like that. It's also very interesting how foreign the idea of relocating for a school can feel to a lot of people. Like it's a scary prospect, even the way you just framed, you know, would I do this for my own kids? Would I move to Australia for a better education? A lot of people live in places that have not the best education in the world. They could do better somewhere else. Um, and it's unusual for people to consider uprooting everything else to move for a school, mm -hmm. which is an interesting phenomenon. We'll come back to this in a little bit because there's a lot here around the micro school movement that we'll also unpack. Um, but I'm also really curious about your experience with this. So you knew, I assume, when you were 10, like you had a pretty deep sense probably that your schooling was the reason that your family was moving. Did you feel a sense of 
pressure after that about around school that sounds hard like that sounds like a burden to carry oh my gosh i think i've always had this burden let's just say growing up in my household there were a lot of pressures you know and 98 percent was not good enough it had to be 100 right like i, I grew up in one of those households uh mm -hmm. but the funny now i think about it, the funny thing was you know when i when we moved it was in march so i had to i had finished fifth grade in india so to do fifth grade again here for the last two months Mm -hmm. And I walked into that classroom. It was a public elementary school in Chicago, in a suburb of Chicago. And I walked into that classroom. I was like, oh, my God, I did this stuff like two years ago. This is the school system that's better. <laughs> I was very confused. And I walked into that. The, even in the next year, I was just like, I know all this. It was so easy. And the kids were not interested they for them it was a chore they were not learning because they wanted to learn so there were all these confusing feelings going on as like a you know when like 12 year old saying i've been uprooted from my life to come here you know i'm grateful for all the great things like look at all the space we have whatever um but this school system is not better the teachers don't seem happier the kids don't seem better the education doesn't seem better what in the world is going on now, it took me a while to appreciate sort of the more American style of education versus the Indian style of rote memorization versus, you know, more conceptual thinking. Um, there's obviously some flaws still in American systems, but um, it was a it was a confusing feeling to, to move and not realize why I was made to do this. That's really interesting. So when you started to understand the differences what were the biggest assets that you were aware of that the American system could offer you? I think the biggest was the, the American system prioritized application of knowledge. That was the big one, is you really had to understand the why and the how behind something, not just the what. That's the one that most people think about. Um, I think there was a lot more of a collaborative intent in the American system, like the group projects, which every kid hates, but like there is a power to doing some group projects. Um, it was, believe it or not, less coercive than the Indian system. <laughs> um, uh, there was a lot more like student choice and student agency in the American system. So those were some of the things I said, I started to over time appreciate. I had a lot more choice in subjects, you know, which language I wanted to learn or how deep I wanted to go in a particular science versus another. Um, I think those were, those were assets that I don't think I would have had in India. And I think they positioned me for a wiser decision in terms of career path later on um, versus what I would have had before. Let's talk about that a little bit, too. Did the move to America for a better education also come with pressure around career path choices? Like, was there a path that was expected of you or did you feel a fair amount of freedom around what you could explore? I don't think it was a move to America. I think it was being born in an Indian household that created the career <laughs> path. Talk, talk more about all, this. All Indians become engineers or doctors. Uh, anything else is not welcome. Just a joke. Uh, but generally, <laughs> that's a stereotype, right? So when I started, when I was in high school, I started thinking about what um, college degrees I would want to, what majors I would want to pursue. Uh, it was going to be engineering and medicine, and I was not going to do medicine. That was not interesting to me. So I actually chose computer science, and this was in the late 90s. Um, so computer science was starting to become super hot. It was a welcome career, and my parents thought that was close enough to engineering that it was okay. So that's what I said. <laughs> I was a computer science major, and then I secretly pursued a minor in psychology because that was a really interesting field to me. Um, you know, I don't think that would have gotten their approval necessarily, but I decided to do it anyway, and it was powerful. Uh, and I think I still use some of the concepts from that today, whereas I don't really use my computer science concepts all that much. Um, but yeah, the the choice of major is is a very cultural thing in Indian households. Mm -hmm. So how far along your path towards being an engineer, did you start to realize that education was actually what was calling to you? Mm -hmm. And was that, a, I imagine, a difficult transition to, to navigate with all of the pressures that you felt around making good use of this American education that you had received? Right. Um, I think at some levels, I've always been called to education, um, mm -hmm. but didn't realize 
the difference between the formal calling and the informal calling. So when I was in high mean? school, I was tutoring. In college, mm-hmm. I was a TA. Um, and even after college, I would sort of do SAT tutoring and all that. You know, I just loved the spark, the spark in someone's eye when they, they get something. That was to, always drove me really, really intensely. And I never saw teaching as a career path for me because it didn't fit the two, right? Engineering or medicine, teaching is not one of those two. Never <laughs> considered it at all. And then it was about three, yeah, three or four years into being a computer scientist at a pharmaceutical company. I was doing bioinformatics, really high impact work. Uh, we were doing a lot of research on cancer therapies, on weight loss medications, on Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Um, and I said, I l- really like this work. Like I'm really engaged in it, but I'm missing something. But like, I'm not, I'm not feeling what I feel like someone in their twenties should be feeling as a burning desire to do more. I should, really should be doing more. And I think it took a while, but I realized that it, it has to do something with teaching. Like I really wanted to do more teaching. And so I had this crazy idea that I would take a little break from my job. I would take a sabbatical for a few months and I would move to India to teach. And it was this this wild idea that I shared with my family and they were like, "Mm, all right, as long as it's a short break, right? Like this feels weird. Like you should take a short break and come back. Um, Anyway, so it was this little idea. So I found a a phenomenal school in Bangalore, in in the suburbs of Bangalore, that was looking for a volunteer math teacher to finish out the school year because their prior teacher had left and they didn't have good local talent. So they had just posted on a random job board and so I emailed them and I said, I'm, I'm going to come to India. I would love to work for your school. You don't have to pay me because I'm just coming for a few months. I just need to figure out a place to stay. And so I spoke to the founder of the school who was just like, why do you want to come here? Like, this is very strange. Like, <laughs> like, like this is a little sketchy. I was like, no, 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 I'm serious. I'm, I'm a sincere person. I lived in India. Then I moved and I'll come back. Um, and so we made it work and I moved to India and I loved it. I took over a math class, a high school math class. Um, and it was like 30 kids, ninth grader. Sorry, the first class was 10th graders. And um, the, in India, the 10th grade is the last year before you take the board exams, which is sort of your high school exit exam. Mm-hmm. And so I had basically a few months to get these kids prepared for their board exams. And oh my goodness, it was challenging. Because you can imagine, it's like the, some people call it the Swiss cheese problem, where every kid has a different gap, and they all sort of need to have the whole slice of cheese before they take the exam. And some of the students I had were doing math at a fourth grade level, but they were sitting in a 10th grade classroom. Some of them were ready for college level math, but they were sitting in a 10th grade classroom. And that experience really, really sort of showed me oh yeah, this is a broken job. Like this job is not right. Like there's something wrong. And I thought it was to do with the school. It was a low income, like high needs school. I was like, oh, like this school's broken. But over time started realizing all schools have the Swiss cheese problem. And I became, I started doing these like evening tutoring sessions with the kids in my class. You know, the place I lived was like, is the apartment upstairs from the lady who ran the school. So she would allow me to bring four or five kids in every day to come in and actually uh, do extra math tutoring. And so I bring these kids home, they would have dinner with this lady and then they would do a tutoring session with me. And then I started to see some real results. And these four or five kids, they were the ones who were struggling that week the most with the concepts. They would get extra tutoring and then they would go back and then they'd start to see results. And I started to see this small group personalization, just in time instruction is the way to teach. And so I started to do this across the whole school. She asked me to become the principal of the school. I stayed more time. I stayed the whole year. And I actually implemented this approach across the whole school. And it was great. Kids were thriving. The teachers were tired, but they were thriving and the parents were happy. Um, And then when the school year ended a year later, I said, this is what I want to do. But I don't want to do it for one school. It's too small. You know, especially in a place like India, when you're even just driving to school, you see hundreds of kids just by the side of the street. They're not in school. They're selling 
wares there, cleaning houses. India is an incredibly poor country. And those kids don't have opportunities. And for me, I really wanted to do something systemically and not for one school or one classroom. So that really then lit the fire and said, I can't go back to computer programming. I can't do that again. I want to really do something in education. So talk us a little bit through the story of how you went from that moment to launching KaiPod, because there were a lot of steps in between. A lot of steps and never something I thought would ever happen. But one of the most important things for me was wanting to make systemic change, right? Like I didn't want to affect just one classroom or one school. I wanted to do something systems. And so speaking to, again, my family, my uncle, um, they said, okay, like what you want to do is transition careers. Fine. We understand. Um, and so I think w- what I thought was I'm going to get a PhD in education in some field of education. I'm going to become this like expert. And everyone I spoke to was like, that's the dumbest idea ever. If you actually want to have systemic change, you need an MBA. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Why? And it's like, well, because the people who are driving real change are doing it from larger organizations. And an MBA is about change in organization. How do you drive change? So, you know, back then an MBA was actually still valuable. I would argue it's less valuable today, but regardless, uh, that's the path that I was advised and I went down. And so I did an MBA. I did a lot of work in education while I was still in school. Um, I was then recruited to join McKinsey's education practice. So McKinsey, huge consulting firm, they have a very deep bench of experts who do education work. And they're advising school districts, they're advising universities, foundations. I was like, great, now we can do system level work. Of course, anyone who's been in consulting knows most of the work is making slide decks. And most of the work is telling other people what to do, but not really having a hand in it. And so after a few years, that started to feel empty. Um, I started looking for other alternatives. I went to Pearson. Uh, Pearson, which is the world's largest education company, I had a role to lead uh, a huge transformation as the company was moving from textbooks to digital products. So there was a great chance to say, let's ensure that every single one of these digital products is highly effective. And so I led that work with a team of more than 100 people across the world. And again, it was a little bit like consulting, maybe one step closer. You know, like we were making these great products, but I didn't get to see them in use. It just wasn't good enough. Then I, within Pearson, I moved into a new role uh, to lead product for our online schools. And so online schools where kids were learning from home, but at their own pace, pre-pandemic, it was a small, one less than 1% of the population. But I started to see the real impact that flexible learning could have. And so this starts to sort of take me down the path towards Kaibot. Essentially, it was Um, A kid who wasn't thriving in an in-person environment for whatever reason. They may have been bullied. They had a health problem. They just wanted to learn at their own pace or from their home. They wanted to travel the world. They were an athlete. You know, whatever it was, online learning was a solution for them. But it led to all these feelings of loneliness. And it led to the parents having to be really the primary educator. And so we knew there were these challenges with it, but we knew that the learning experience itself was pretty great. The kids were actually, for the kids for whom this was right, they were doing phenomenally well. So that got me thinking about what are some other support systems you could build in uh, to help online schools. But, you know, there was no appetite to do that because we were an online school company. And then the pandemic happens. And then like all great stories, right, like that just changes your life completely. Uh, For me in 2020, the seeing how so many families loved their online school experience They didn't like the Zoom school part of it, but they did like the fact that the child had flexibility. Um, It gave me a hypothesis that this was not going to be the end, that there there was something big happening where more parents were going to step in to choose. And choice didn't just mean moving across the world. It meant, I'm not just going to choose a different school. I'm going to choose a different way of learning for my child. And so I really saw a huge demand for these pandemic pods lingering after the pandemic where people could choose an online curriculum, but then pair it with an in-person experience. And that's what Kaipod is all about. So give us, I feel bad saying the quick story about Kaipod because there's so much here and there's so many pieces that I want to dig into, but just like the high level for people who haven't heard of Kaipod yet. The, the short version of the story of 
how it was born and what it became. And then we'll dig into some of the specifics of how it works and the philosophy behind it and all of that. Sounds good. Yeah. The short version of it is there's two parts to KaiPod. One is where we run learning pods across the country where a child can choose their own curriculum, but come in in person for tutoring, enrichment, social time, right? It's sort of a commu- in-person community for a kid who might be enrolled in an online school or might be homeschooling. And then the second thing we do is we run an accelerator for folks who want to start their own micro schools or learning pods. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of educators who are looking for alternative careers. And so we want to help them consider running their own school as a career. And so we help them get that off the ground. Amazing. So you launched KaiPod during the pandemic or soon uh, after? When when did was the first? It was in the September of 2021. So still during the pandemic. Okay. Um, and it was in Boston, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, tell me the story about this first school, because the first one's always the scariest and it's the most unknown and yeah. it's the grand experiment for the hypothesis you're building out. It really is. We, I mean, we had a pilot, <laughs> we ran a pilot in July of that summer with nine kids for six weeks or four weeks. And those kids made three times the progress than they would have in a traditional classroom. But just, we were just looking at the analysis of like how many units they completed and with mm-hmm. very strong grades. And every single one of those kids said, I actually love this way of learning. I loved having my own ability to move while having friends around and a tutor or whatever. They loved it. The parents loved it. But it was a little too foreign for them to consider leaving a traditional environment. And so for us, there was an insight there that we've, we've hit on something that actually works really well but it is not yet ready to be adopted. So that was a scary outcome of the pilot. Uh, so, but we started recruiting for families that fall uh, and we launched our first pod in Newton. Our space was like a rented room from a tutoring center, right? Like they had an empty room that they weren't using during the day. So we paid them a few hundred bucks a week to use that room. And these kids would come in person. There was a learning coach who was a former teacher. She was there supporting all of these kids. They would do enrichment activities every day. They would go out for walks. And these kids just said, I have never felt like I belonged. All of these kids had been homeschooled or in online schools for one reason or another. And they had never felt as strong of a sense of community. You know, folks who've been homeschooled, they have lots of friends. They make lots of social, they have lots of social groups, but often the, the complaint I hear is it's not a consistent set of groups, right? There's a lot, some, some kids come, some kids don't. It's not, they don't get the consistency that they crave. And what we saw in that first pod is homeschooling, families have homeschooled for years said, I now feel like this is my group. These seminary kids, these are my people. And that was for us really interesting because we didn't think that that would be the value. We thought the value would be academic support, rigor. No, it's just community. These kids really craved community. And families said, I love that I have choice. I, I can come any days. I can skip some days. I, have, I choose my child's curriculum. So that first year, we learned so much about how parents think about schooling and how much they're willing to do for their kids. And those first few families who are still with us, like they are just incredible advocates for this approach, but they're also, they push us to think about what are we really delivering here, right? We tried to institute some like academic rigor periods and they were like, no, we don't want that. What we want is more support for the kids and in these ways. So they've been really helping us refine the model still three years later. You're talking about learning so much about how parents think about school and what they want out of school. What were some of the biggest things that surprised you? And what are some of the biggest things that you think most people in education miss about what parents actually want? Hmm. Um, gosh, um, I'll answer it in this way. I've over time come to appreciate that schools do three jobs. Traditional schools do three jobs. The first job is content instruction, right? We help you learn the things we believe you're going to need to learn. Number two is we build 
social and emotional skills. Like how do you interact with society? How do you regulate your emotions when you're starting to get dysregulated, et cetera? Like the, the sort of softer things. And then the third job they do is childcare. Right? Like it or not, that is a very important job of schools. And all three of those jobs have different levels of importance to different families. Right? Some families don't care about the child care job. They care more about the social and emotional. For some families, the content is really important. But schools have to hit each one of those three jobs in different ways. And one of the things that I think people in education don't appreciate is how important that third job is to the vast majority of Americans. And any online-only solution, and I learned this when I was at Pearson and Connections, any online-only solution will have a ceiling to its growth because the vast majority of Americans need school to perform a childcare job. And so if you're an online only solution, you can't do that. Do you have any sense roughly of what that ceiling is? Mm -hmm. Like what percentage? And I know it's a, it's a moving target now, especially post pandemic when remote work has changed so much. But how how do you think about where that ceiling is? And you have some sense of like what percentage of the population yeah. in the foreseeable future online education is even an option for? Uh, before the pandemic, we actually did some research on this at Pearson. And I think the outcome was something like two to four percent was the ceiling. Wow. Very low ceiling, which means you are never going to go beyond four percent of the national population with an online only solution. And so you are fighting for market share in this tiny, tiny pocket. Post-pandemic, remote work has certainly made things easier, but also the other thing that has happened is the childcare job has gotten mixed in with the whole social and emotional job, where people say, I actually want my kid to be around other kids. Like That's really important to me. I want them to build those social skills on a consistent basis, and the pandemic taught people the importance of that because they saw what happens when their kids are isolated for a year or two. So I think the ceiling has gone up maybe to, let's say, 10%, but it's not 50%. It's still very small because even though childcare may no longer be the issue, it's the social and emotional need of, I need my kid to be around other kids. So that's where we think HiPod has a unique offering, right? If you're an online school who's struggling with growth, if your kids can come to a HiPod for the social aspects, the tutoring, the enrichment, you know, and the child care, really, in some ways, um, you can actually grow with Kaipod's help, right? I have no interest to compete with online schools. I actually think they can grow. And so we work with a huge number of kids from online schools, a huge number. And we're partnered with a massive number of online schools for exactly this reason, because we can solve a problem that they're not equipped to solve today. Which is one of the things that I find really interesting about your model is the fact that you are very explicitly solving the child care and socialization problem with a very open-ended invitation on the curricular side for people to choose what models they want their kids to be learning within. Can you talk a little bit about how that works functionally? Because we haven't gotten into that side of KaiPod yet. It's one of the coolest yeah. things about what you do. It was not something we intended to start with. In fact, in the beginning, the original business plan for KaiPod said everyone would be using the same online curriculum. But as we interviewed families and as we started to recruit them, we saw that the, the folks who were in online schools or who'd been homeschooling had very strong opinions about the curriculum they had chosen. In fact, it was after many years of trying alternatives that they said, I really want to use this and I don't want someone to change it. I don't want someone to force me to use something different. So we were almost forced into this decision of actually let the families bring the curriculum. We will be a coach. We will help them no matter what they're in. And so it was a source of terror for us. <laughs> we didn't realize that like you had 10 kids, they could be in 10 different curriculum. And the learning coach would have to figure out how to support each child in their own curriculum. Uh, but it actually, believe it or not, works incredibly well. And so for us, the it's now become a core belief of our company that parents deserve choice in what and how their child is learning. And sometimes it can be taken in a political way, but I really intend it to be parents know best about how their child learns best and which curricula is working, which one is not. And we respect that choice at Kaipod. 
we have lots of recommendations, we have lots of opinions. If we see that something's really not working for a child, it is our obligation to tell the family, hey, here's what I'm observing. But ultimately, it's a parent's decision. And so, yeah, in our KaiPod locations, you'll have kids all using different math platforms, using different English platforms, or reading or writing platforms. Um, and often kids will, kids and parents will see what someone else is using and it will help them figure out something new. And that's been really powerful. It's like, it's almost like market effects being brought to curriculum in one classroom. How does that work logistically for the adult in the room? Because I imagine that can be a daunting proposition, especially for someone who's stepping into that kind of role for the first time. Like it makes sense that if you have some level of, of expertise in all of these topics mm -hmm. that you can, you know, a kid can come to you with a question about something that they're struggling with in, you know, whatever program that they're in, you can help them with the nuances of the math equation they're having trouble solving or the, the grammatical question that they're having a hard time figuring out. Um, and anyone who's been in some type of alternative learning environment knows that it's not that hard to go look up an answer if you're, you know, stuck on a particular nuance that you maybe haven't seen before and you're in the instructor role. Um, but it would seem that there would be logistical challenges with this too. And I'm playing devil's advocate yeah. right now because I, I think what you're doing is awesome. Like I don't actually, like it makes sense to me, but I think like it, it warrants is. some, some digging into like, if you have an adult in the room who is facilitating 10 different experiences for 10 different kids, mm -hmm. and maybe they're not even fully familiar with all the programs that different kids are inside of, how do they set benchmarks and like, monitor whether or not a kid is doing enough or moving through something quickly enough how do they structure the day around kids working through very disparate things that don't fit together in terms of scheduling how do they support each kid with the challenges that they might be running into inside of a different program if the adult in the room is not even familiar with the program like it seems like it could get complicated very quickly so yes, absolutely. In fact, we thought so deeply about this our first year because we were terrified that this would not work <laughs> or just could not work. But one of the early decisions we made is that all of our learning coaches would be classroom educators, would be people who have had at least three years of teaching experience. Okay. And that was intentional. And I think in hindsight, a very, very good decision, even though those folks are more expensive um, than someone maybe who hasn't had a classroom teaching experience they are used to an incredible amount of complexity. You know, like a, an eighth grade math teacher from a traditional middle school is used to seeing 100 kids a week and used to writing lesson plans, grading assessments, uh, grading homework, and da, 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 da. They're used to doing all these incredibly complicated things. And now we say to them, actually, instead of all of that, you're gonna have 12 kids all week. And those 12 kids are gonna be in these programs. Maybe it's like eight different programs. So spend some time creating your login for those programs, understanding the child's progress, what they're, where they are, what their grades are, how to communicate with their online teacher. You just have to understand that for the year. That actually is something that teachers say, oh yeah, I can do this. This is not that hard for me. Because they're used to doing something much more complicated behind the scenes. So there is a learning curve for sure. It's not like day one, they're proficient. It takes probably six to eight weeks for a learning coach to really get to know all of their kids and their curricula. But because they're not doing all the other busy work of homeworks and assessments and all that, they're just there to support the child in the moment, set goals every week, track goals every week. It actually works incredibly well. And then it creates this beautiful partnership between the parent, the coach, and the child that all three of them are working together towards the same goal, and the child is in the curriculum that works best for them. And it's the adults who are adapting, rather than the adult picking the curriculum and every child having to adapt. Do you set any kind of parameters around what types of curricula are allowed inside of a KaiPod classroom, or can kids literally do anything that the family chooses? I wouldn't call it parameters, but I would say we have opinions. Okay. Um, we we ask we we suggest that families pick curricula that are mostly self-paced, that are not all video based, like not all sitting on Zoom all day, um, and where the child can self-direct. Those are some of the early parameters. 
um, there are some curricula, I obviously will not name any here, that we just don't think are high quality. And we will be very honest with families when we see that. For example, there's one that we see uh, a fair amount and it's just, it's very easy to guess and check. So when a child gets a quiz, they get it wrong, they just enter again, enter again, they can do it a hundred times until they get the answer right. And we say, okay, for, for most children, that's not gonna be the right way because it's not giving them any feedback on why they got something wrong. There's no educator on the other end seeing that data. So there's those types of things that we look for and we will give feedback and advice to the family but I don't think there's ever been a curriculum where we've said, no, you cannot bring this into Kaipad because we just deeply, deeply value the family's choice um, and their opinions on how the child should learn. How do you think about success metrics of the model if so much of it hinges on someone else's program? Mm -hmm. It's really hard. <laughs> it sounds hard. Really hard. <laughs> How do you think about it? So obviously we have our set of key outcomes, which include academics. It includes like, our progress on academics. It includes social outcomes, like as a child becoming more confident in who they are. It includes parent satisfaction, et cetera. Um, on the academic front, which I think was the crux behind your question, you know, the, the best bench model we found is the MAP assessment, the measures of academic progress. It's a nationally benchmarked assessment. It's not that hard. It's not that long. It doesn't take up too much learning time, but it is a really great way to get a quick dipstick on where each child is at different times of the year. So we run that and we see that our kids are making progress. But we also see that, for example, students who are coming two days a week to Kaipod do not make as much progress as the students who come five days a week. So there is a message in there for us to say, okay, like actually I think coming more frequently is creating some sort of a, a higher outcome. And we will often talk to families who may be struggling with particular subjects to say, hey, if you came more frequently, it's actually good for you too. And here's the data that shows that. Uh, we also see, yes, to your point, there's some curricula where the kids just don't make progress. And we can just see the child is not learning. Now, usually in those cases, we don't have to wait for the MAP assessment to tell us that. We've seen it in the way the child is engaging with the content. And so usually we will have had that conversation with the family already to say, I think it's time for a new option for your kid. And if the MAP data shows that, then we can also use that as additional evidence for them to hopefully make a change. And the vast majority of times families respect that, appreciate that, and they make a change. Usually we see that benefit the child. Uh, but we see that as a very important role for us is to continue to monitor the academic rigor, even though we don't have control over how frequently a child is coming or what they're using. Today's episode is sponsored by my friends at the John Galt Mortgage Company. My friends Mitch and Tim launched the John Galt Mortgage Company last year after spending years working in the real estate world and realizing that mortgages are way more expensive than they need to be. Most people don't realize how much extra profit is baked into the cost of a mortgage. Most real estate agents don't even know. So Mitch and Tim decided to build a new kind of mortgage, one where they voluntarily cap their profit on every transaction. And by lowering their commission, they pass the savings on to you, the buyer, in the form of a lower interest rate than what everyone else is charging. I talked to Mitch and Tim just the other week, and they told me about multiple examples of customers who are saving literally hundreds of dollars a month on their mortgage payments compared to what they would be paying with a traditional lender. Mitch and Tim are old friends of mine who believe in economic liberty, entrepreneurship, and financial independence. They also named their company the John Galt Mortgage Company, which tells you everything you need to know about them. If you're in the market for a house, you can find out more about what they're doing at www.johngaltmortgage.com, or you can find a link to their site down in the show notes. Okay, back to the interview. I want to go back to your point about online options being inaccessible for most families because of the childcare and also socialization component. And one of the things I absolutely love about what you're doing is that you're allowing parents to dial in the specificity of the choices that they're making. So they're not you're you're taking apart disparate pieces that should be disparate decisions. Parents should not have to make 
simultaneous choices about their child's socialization and community and who's watching them all day and their parents working hours based on child care needs Very true. and curriculum all at the same time like they sh that shouldn't all be a thing that is packaged and you're allowing parent to have the freedom to make those choices separately um and you know you're maintaining the bundling of things that make more sense like the social components which are a little harder to separate out from each other just like functionally um but you're also making online schools more accessible to people because they don't have to think about the child care component but i want to go back to those numbers four percent is really low of of people who pre-pandemic had access to or like would make the choice to choose an online school what can you go can you get a little bit more granular about like how that number was reached like is that how many stay-at-home parents like sure. how many families what percentage of families have a stay-at-home parent are there other factors at play like what were the things that you were looking at to assess that yeah gosh i don't remember all the research now but it was more than just stay-at-home parents because the number of stay-at-home parents is closer to 40 to 50 percent uh mm -hmm. it was around stay-at-home there was a ability to stay at home, there was a willingness to stay at home, and then there was a willingness to have your child at home. It was like those three broad oh. factors came together to say 4% was the ceiling. And the third one, the willingness to have your child at home, had a lot of those social and emotional factors. Like, do I want my kid to be alone just with me all day? Um, you know, homeschooling families long, for a long time have had communities of other homeschooling families. So they don't see that concern of socialization because they're like, okay, I've got this co-op, I've got these other Facebook groups of moms and dads that I hang out with. Great. Online schooling families have not had that. They've not had those communities. They've not been as plugged into the homeschooling communities. So for them, like if you're talking to a traditional public school family to say, do you want your kid home all day? I'm like, no, I don't. Like they need to be with other kids their age, right? You'll hear that. So that's what brought the number way, way down. And I think it's still the number that keeps it down. Uh, it's still the factor that keeps the number down post pandemic. That's so interesting. How much of that do you think is a misunderstanding of what like the possibilities are with having your kid at home? Like how many of those people do you think like just sort of have a, like they, they sort of see the stereotype of like the kid's going to be at home and like annoying the parent all day and super socially <laughs> awkward and not going to yeah. be able to talk to anybody. And they're just like, no, 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 we can't do that versus like how much of it do you think is like a, a, a branding problem of alternatives and also like a access to information problem like i know this is a very sweeping generalization but i f i feel like there's something here too there's, yeah there's both i mean gosh like for the longest time right like there's been this perception of the homeschoolers are strange <laughs> I, hey strange is good like we want strange but yeah. um, there's been that perception that's the branding right of alternative mm -hmm. I, gosh when i started cut out so many people told me don't call it alternative education because people will think that's the dropouts and the rejects and i was like what like it's just an alternative it's a different word um but people didn't like mm -hmm. that so there's a branding problem for sure um there's an awareness problem but whatever the reason is like the pandemic just reinforced in people's minds that i don't want my kid alone Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think we're going to get past that. That's that's a that's a long term trauma that this entire generation of parents will not forget. Because of the pandemic, why do you have a sense like I'm, I'm sure you talk to parents about this as part of their decision around Kaipod in the conversations that you have? What about it is so traumatic for them? Is it just like the the suddenness of how like unprepared everyone was, one was and how uncomfortable it was? Is it, you know, they saw their kids regressing socially and struggle with that? Like, what are some of the biggest? I mean, obviously, it's like lumped in with lots of other very major social and emotional things that were happening that also heightened the emotional experience of the entire the entire thing but what what are some of the things that make it so traumatic for the parents that you talk to i mean weirdly the people i talk to are not the ones who are considering alternatives right the ones who've been most traumatized by the pandemic are the ones who are saying, I'm sending my kid back to the school the first day it reopens. And I don't ever want to talk about anything. 
thing again. So I don't know, I, to be honest, right? Like, I think it's all those things, the trauma, the, the suddenness of it, the regression, the lack of support that they had as parents and the judgment that everyone put on them for trying their best. The people I speak to are the ones who said, yes, that was traumatic, but in some ways my kid thrived with all the flexibility. My kid loved having freedom and loved not having to see that bully every day. And so I'm actually looking for something different. So I think I speak to a different segment. And these are the people who, for whom there was a silver lining out of the pandemic. I find it really interesting how simultaneously it feels like the pandemic both accelerated and decelerated the forward progress of alternative education and i i also don't like the term alternative education but for different reasons yeah. than, than well, the people are. who are talking to you i don't like it because i feel like it it's one of those terms where like you've already conceded the winning ground to the other side it's other like the other side holds the standard and then you're like the weird thing that is different to but they're always the standard that you're comparing everything else against and i find that very I don't know. The marketer in me is like, well, if we agree to that, then we've kind of already lost, right? It's like Actually, saying that some something someone stands for a position and then everyone who against it is like anti that thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And that's the that's the exception. I sometimes have that same feeling towards micro schools. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't thought about it in the lens of micro schools, but that makes sense. Like there's a school and this is something less than a school. And I've, gosh, I've thought so long as like, can we rebrand this to a, a positive? Because micro, small, it, it implies mm -hmm. something less. Now, I think that with the movement itself is moving so quickly that it's creating a positive association. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll tell, I see what you're reading. Like, don't cede the ground to the status quo. Cre what mm -hmm. are you for, Rodney? What are you against? Yeah, like painting the very positive image that you're moving toward. Because that's also part of the problem, I think. Like there is, I spend a lot of time thinking about the branding of yeah. the the education movement. Mm -hmm. um, like you get a mix of parents who are running towards something. There's a very clear mm -hmm. vision of better. But then there's an equal number of parents that just want to get out of the thing that exists because it's terrible for them or for their children. Like it's not where they want to be. But they're much more focused on getting out as opposed to getting somewhere else. And that is a very, you have to have something that you're moving towards in order f to execute your exit well, <laughs> to have something positive that you're moving towards. I mean, you can get out of the public school system if it's not well suited for your child and end up somewhere that's not very much better, just different. This is, this is one of the core beliefs I have. You know, there's a growing up in India, you know, connecting to the beginning of our conversation, I saw 70 ish percent of my you know, kids in my city go to private schools. And I spent a lot of time thinking and studying on why or how that happened, because that wasn't always the case. How did the government mm -hmm. sector go from 100 percent of kids to 30 percent of kids? And could that happen here? And one of the things I've started to think about is this vicious cycle that we're underway in education, in K-12 education in America. You know, you start with a budget crisis. When you have a budget crisis, you cut costs. The biggest source of costs in a school is teachers. So you cut teachers, you get rid of pay raises. As a result of those, everyone else is left with more kids or a harder job. So the highest caliber staff who have other options leave. When the best teachers in a school district leave, it usually drives a departure from families. And when those families leave, it creates another budget crunch. And then that spins your wheel again. And that, there is this vicious cycle happening in school districts. It has been accelerated 20x by the ending of the fiscal stimulus from COVID times, the SR funding ending. So we're gonna see this wheel accelerate, more teachers will leave, which will drive more parents to leave. So in my mind, I have this image of parents jumping off of this Ferris wheel. They're like, I gotta get, like I have to jump off before it goes one more loop around. And what I'm trying to build is a wonderful landing pad for the families who are jumping off this Ferris wheel. 
and I want to build a phenomenal micro school in every community so that for the parents who are jumping off the Ferris wheel, there is a great place for them to go to. And these micro schools, which we are helping start up as part of our Catalyst program, you know, there should be tens of thousands of them across America. And then you'll start to see this world where more and more families are choosing the alternatives. And we don't call them alternatives anymore because it's like the, what is it, like the majority minority states, right? It's like the majority minority school district where most kids are not in the school district. There is a real chance in the next five to 10 years, we will have school districts where the majority of kids don't go to the public school. And that's going to create this incredible transformation locally, in some ways negative, but in a lot of ways positive. And you're going to have all these parents choosing the right school for their kid and all these teachers creating these wonderful environments, thriving in their new profession and all these small businesses sort of transforming American education in a new way. I'm just so excited about seeing that kind of a vision. Um, and I think over time, we'll see more and more communities flip where the majority of kids are going to school. Do you see that as a net positive or a net negative? Because people lean very strongly in both directions yeah. and they like to fight about it in my Twitter comments. I yeah. hear a lot I'm, about those. I get sides. myself in trouble, I, but I do. I have to take a stand. It is a net positive. It will mean lots of pain in the short term, right? With the incredible sort of reduction in funding that public systems will see, it will mean we have to close more school buildings. We'll have to lay off more school staff. We'll have to cut services and cut programs. That is going to be the pain. But the outcome of it will be more options in each community. And for me, I'm very clear that no one thing can do everything. Like the fact that we ask our school systems to serve every single kid, no matter what their need is, is so unfair of an ask to the school system. And it is the number one driver behind rising costs, right? Sometimes we think like, oh, it's like the school district is like such a bloated bureaucracy. If we get rid of the school district, you go cut costs. Yeah, maybe, but like the real bloat in costs is when a subscale school district has to figure out a way to serve every single student need. Whereas if you said, actually, we have all of these different options in this community who are serving kids who are gifted, serving kids who are neurodivergent, serving kids who are high autistic needs, serving kids who are athletes who just need more flexibility. We have all these different pathways within the community. And each of those pathways is financially sustainable on its own. And it is surviving on public funding like an ESA. And now, by the way, that original school has a, a more narrow set of needs. It can create its financial model accordingly. That actually is a win for them. So despite the short-term pain, I think public schools will come out stronger on the other end because they will be serving the kids for whom they are the right fit rather than being forced to serve everyone who just happens to live in that zip code. Who are the kids that the public model is right for? Is it a like a learning archetype? I know that's a very not I mean that very non-technically, yeah. but you know, like are there particular in, like kids that prefer types of environments that are a better fit? Is it a particular type of family? I think for the record, I do not believe the traditional classroom is right for any kid. Whether that's public, private, or micro school. If you're building a micro school with 30 kids in your class, I don't want to have you in my program because that's not right for any kid. However, I do think the public system could adopt the approach of microschooling within the building. They could have flexible pathways where technology is used to enhance the learning. The teachers become coaches rather than instructors, right? You can do that within the public system. I don't think the system is ready to take on a change that big. So I actually just reject the premise of your question entirely um, because I don't, think <laughs> it's, I don't think a large classroom is right, right for anyone. Um, it's just not how we are meant to learn. It just happens to be an artifact of a long ago decision that was made to industrialize education. What about, so in, in India, when this transition happened, and maybe you can speak a little bit to the history of this too, like, I don't know how much of a sense you have of like the timeline on which this, this transition occurred, where it went to 70% private. Um, one of the big things that people 
really push back on with from you know they're hearing stories about people launching alternatives to the public school that's pulling public daughters dollars away from the public schools and like one of the reasons that people really push back on the ESA thing is that families that have the means to get out will or kids that have the support to get out will and the kids that are going to be left behind are perhaps the ones that need the support the most and they're going to be left with you know a stripped down basically you know pillaged system they're going to be left with the bones of it to try to get by and i don't know i'm i'm really curious like how that has played out in india and also you know what your response would be to the people who would have that pushback yeah so many responses so first of all you're not pulling you're not pulling public dollars out of a public system you're pulling local tax dollars out of a government school it was not your money to begin with it was the local it was the local taxpayers who paid that money into a school system that is no longer serving them so what you're saying is actually okay let's create a way for you to have that money back and then let's allow everyone to choose where that money goes. In fact, what I would love to see is this grand experiment where in one school district, every family, every single family gets an ESA. And they can take that ESA to their local school district to say, here's my money, build with it. Or they can take it to a private school or they can take it to a co-op or whatever, right? Like families should actively make the choice rather than a default that your money is sitting with this government school. Right. Like my wonderful mayor where I live, she's great, but like she doesn't have any business running a school. Right. Why should she run a school that has a, a greater advantage financially than my micro school? In fact, families should be able to decide where to spend their money. So that's my first response. I think the second response is families with means leave, families without means don't. Um, th that's an education problem. And there are phenomenal organizations across some of these choice states that are creating awareness for families. They're saying, let me tell you what your options are. And I feel like one of the people you absolutely have to have on this podcast is Jenny Clark from Love Your School. And she, I don't know if you had her before, I don't think you have, but she is phenomenal at talking about the, the, the power of choice for a family and how it can completely transform every single aspect of their life. And so her entire organization is dedicated to educating families about their options. So then I don't think that criticism remains that the families without means get stuck in a broken system. Now, to your question of what happened in India. Yeah, the government system is terrible. It has only gotten worse. But that's because it continues to be underfunded. It continues to be... Um, and sorry, the big difference in India is like, it's not like in the US where money follows the kid. Uh, it's not that result. It, the, the government just hasn't funded the system because their priorities are elsewhere. Um, in India, the, the people who are paying for private schools, they're paying out of the pocket. There's no ESA. There's no voucher system. It's all private pay. So I think what you're starting to see is people, because the government system got so underfunded, they said, no matter what I have to do, I will take my kid out of that school. And so what we want to see is a system that doesn't get that bad and a system that continues to be funded at the appropriate level, but it has to compete for families. You're working on scaling Kaipod very quickly. Mm -hmm. You're in five states now? Our centers are in five states, but our partners are in 25 states. That's amazing. So you're moving very quickly across the country. Um, I would imagine the goal is to continue to accelerate that growth. Um, what are you seeing in terms of market demand, in terms of parents' hunger for this, but also readiness for it? Um, what kind of pushback, if any, are you getting from prospective families, from communities that you're moving into? What you're, I'm, you're, on the ground learning a lot about the state of how people are thinking about education in America. Yeah. What are you seeing? So yeah, our I very much believe that microschooling can be a red blue strategy, it can be an urban rural strategy, it can be a high income low income strategy. Microschools are probably the only school model that can serve every single aspect because they are so flexible. Because there's not like everyone looks and feels the same. So that's that's a hypothesis we aim to prove in the next couple of years by being in all the states, by being in cities and rural environments. 
In terms of market demand pushback, it's really interesting. We see two archetypes of markets. There's the Phoenixes of the world and the Orlandos of the world, where there's just so much choice. Still not enough, but there's still a lot of choice. And oh my goodness, when a family comes to visit a Kai Pod in Phoenix, they're looking around. They're like, I don't like the color of the chair. I don't like the number of kids in this area. They are so hyper specific and they give you incredible feedback. They are consumers, educated consumers of education. They're informed. And so in running a micro school in Phoenix is like running a restaurant in New York City. Like you better have your shit together, right? Otherwise that patron is not coming back. And so we learned the first year how to really deliver a consumer grade experience where we were competing every single day for every single kid. And that made us so strong. Then there are markets like Boston, our first market, where parents aren't used to choice. And basically they're used to two bundles, the public school bundle and the private school bundle. And you say to them, actually, you can modularize all of it and we'll create a package for you. And that's scary for a lot of families. So we've had to tone down our language of how modular it really is to start to get families comfortable with the concept of picking. And then over time, they love the flexibility. So we see those two. So I wouldn't say it's pushback. I think it's different approaches. In Phoenix, mm -hmm. you maximize your modular messaging. In Boston, you sort of reduce it a little bit to say, the school is really of our personal approach to your child. And then over time, you tell them all the other flexibility to have. Is it typically pretty intimidating for a parent to be told that they have to choose their own curriculum for their kids? Because that's one of the biggest things I think that impedes people from homeschooling, too, is the sense that they just like don't know what to choose. Yeah, it is intimidating. So we now have a set of bundles where we say, like, depending on what, what your goals are for your child, here's a bundle that we think could be a great place to start. And that instantly gives them a little comfort. And sure enough, if you give them the bundle, then they start questioning things and then they start going down the <laughs> path, which is great. It's like having something to react to is always better than a blank sheet. So we give them mm -hmm. something to react to and that helps lower the stress. I love that. I love so much the fact that you're you're such a great exemplar of one of the most fundamental truths, I think, about what education can and should be, which is that attention should be very localized and very, you know, white glove service for the kids. Like you should be in an environment with a small amount of people who know you and who care about you and who have a very good understanding of, you know, what exactly you need, what exactly you're working on. But you should also have access to all that the world has to offer, which the Internet age has made possible. It's made the institutional model obsolete because you don't need the economy of scale for information anymore because we have evolved beyond it. And so you don't have to be in a big school where there just happens to be enough people that you're going to find someone who has expertise in the particular thing that you're interested in because you have all the resources on the internet. And so you can go back to the localized model of community, which is how humans are designed to function. We're not designed to function in schools of thousands of people. We That isn't a community. That's a mini city. <laughs> That's not personal at all. Um, so you can, you can serve the level of personal connection that kids thrive in and that humans thrive in adults too um and i love the way that you're you're framing those two things the way that those two truths the local and the global can play together um because it's one of the things that i think i'm i'm most excited about seeing emerge um, cause like I grew up in that kind of education where I was homeschooled and in like very local homeschool communities, but learning via the internet, um, and it worked mm -hmm. and it was great. And I want to see more of that. Um, I want to get philosophical for a second. Um, I don't know if you, you may have, this may not actually be that philosophical. You might have answers to these questions, but I don't expect you to, because they're, they're broad and I, I wish we had more definitive answers, but 
you know, you talked at the beginning about growing up and and going into college during the explosion of the computing era and during the explosion of the internet era. Um, it should have changed more about education than it did. Because information suddenly became immediately accessible. And through that lens, in a lot of ways, I think we use the internet very badly. You have a computer in your pocket that can access every book that has ever been written, every interview with every great thinker that has ever been recorded, every study that's ever been produced, and every single you know, piece of informational content that was designed for entertaining consumption, not just, you know, reading a dry study. Um, and yet most people use those computers in their pocket to text their friends and scroll through videos on social media, mm -hmm. not to learn. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there's the grand question of like, is this a software problem? Like, have we just not developed the correct tools? Is it a cultural problem? We just don't, you know, value information enough. Is it just unearthing the more undesirable parts of our human nature where we don't actually care about learning nearly as much as we should? Um, is it just like a, a, a cultural problem where it's just, you know, it's it's hard to move the inertia of how we have always done things and to see the new possibility, even if it's easily accessible. Um, but we have, we could have access to everything. Most of us forget that it's there, but very few of us are taking advantage of it. Um why has education been so slow to catch up with almost every other industry that has radically transformed yeah. since getting access to the internet? If I was an alien civilization set out to destroy the <laughs> earth, I would do whatever I could to convince the smartest graduates to go work at Instagram and Snapchat rather than at schools and medical facilities, right? Today, the smartest kids who are coming out of computer science programs or whatever else, they go work for high paying jobs in San Francisco at social media companies. They're not going to work at Khan Academy, Pearson. They're not going to build incredibly strong learning environments. That's one. I think the second, which is probably less weird, <laughs> less philosophical, is a big system can't change without pressure, right? Large companies don't change without um, competitors, the same way a school district cannot change without competitors. And competitors have always been fighting on an uneven playing field because you're always competing with free. The school district is free and all competitors are not. That has always been a truism until the rise of ESAs. The ESAs changed the playing field to say, now you are not competing with free, now you are free. So now in Arizona, our Kaipod sites can be free for a family. So now I actually finally have a chance to compete on a fair playing field with them. And which means that it will create the pressure to change. And it will be painful. A lot of the school districts will fail but it will finally create the pressure. So for me, the ESA movement is not about, great, more market for me. It's about creating competitive pressure where none has existed. And I think that is really the fundamental root cause of why education hasn't changed, but everything else has. In entertainment, right? Like cable companies dominated everything until there was competitive pressure from streaming services. And each of those streaming services competes with each other. There is no monopoly there. In healthcare, right, when there's a local monopoly of a hospital, outcomes are poor. 
But when there is competition in the community, outcomes rise. This is a this is a truism of economics. And I think that same principle applies in education is there just hasn't been competition, but now there will be. If people want to know more about what you're doing, where would you send them next? And can you talk especially about people who want to start micro schools? where they can find more about the support work that you do. Yeah, happy to. So uh, certainly our website, kaipodlearning.com, is the obvious place to go. Um, you can also look for Kaipod Catalyst that's on our website. That's the program to help you start a school. Um, and really, we're looking for people who are educators or parents, folks who are really passionate about their school in their community. And they want to create something because you know, they're the ones who said, one day I'll do this better. You know, One day I'll be in charge of this school. If you have, if you had that feeling before, today's that day. Go to that site, go figure out how to apply for Catalyst. Um, that's really what I would say to folks. But you're always all welcome to reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter. Um, you know, name's pretty easy to find. So uh, I would love to talk to anyone who's, you know, has a, had a new thought come out of this episode. And can you talk very briefly before we wrap about what types of schools? you help people develop inside of Catalyst? Because I don't want people to think that it has to be exactly what you're building with KaiPod. And if it's not that, then maybe, like if that's not their vision, then maybe this isn't a fit because I really would love to encourage people to reach out to you because what you're doing is really amazing. Thank you. Yes, uh, the the whole beauty and premise behind Catalyst is it's your school and your vision, not my school, not my KaiPod vision. It's not a franchise. This is your school. So if you have a vision to serve gifted kids, neurodivergent kids, student athletes, actors, high schoolers, preschoolers, middle schoolers, whatever segment it is that you want to serve, Whatever way you want to serve them, it could be a Montessori approach, an outdoor-based approach, a project-based approach, a traditional approach, whatever it is you want to do and whoever it is for, Catalyst can be right for you. And essentially, we're looking for folks who say, I've got a strong idea, I've got a strong connection to my community, and I need the help to get the school off the ground. If you want to, if you have those three characteristics, you're a great applicant for Catalyst. You don't need to have everything figured out. You don't need a lot of money. Uh, like we don't charge you anything to be in Catalyst. The, essentially, the goal is we want to help you take your vision into the community and launch it, because our vision is tens of thousands of schools across the country that are serving kids and families in new ways. So we want you to be a part of that. That's an amazing vision. I am. As you know, very, very in support of that. This has been such a fun conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time for this. This has been this has been wonderful and hopefully very helpful for some of the people listening. Thank you for having me. It was really good. My absolute pleasure. We'll talk more soon. All right, my friends, that is a wrap for today. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I hope that you found this valuable. Please leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. Please like the video on YouTube. And please don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you listen to make sure that you don't miss next week's episode. Thank you so much, friends. I will see you next week.